Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. The British government has pledged hundreds of billions in funding. The US Congress has approved trillions. Capitalist governments in multiple countries seem to be abandoning privatisation and market competition for nationalisation and central coordination. It looks quite a lot like some of the things socialists call for, but corporate profits are being subsidised. The big banks and finance sector are untouched and workers are receiving too little too late when it comes to income and safety protections. In fact, lack of personal protective equipment is killing frontline health workers in the UK and 10 million workers have joined unemployment lines in just two weeks in the US. What does this U-turn in policy direction by the capitalists amid a complete failure of their system say about capitalism and the socialist alternative? This episode of Socialism, recorded last week, looks at coronavirus and state intervention. Is this socialism? Can I have a piece of paper? Of course. So I'm here this episode with Sarah Sachs Aldridge, who is the Socialist Party's national organiser. Hello, Sarah. Hello, James. A couple of episodes ago, you turned the tables on me, and now we're back to our natural positions. I'll be interviewing you on the issue of state intervention and the complete reversal of decades of capitalist orthodoxy in the face of this pandemic, what this demonstrates and what socialists are saying about it. So let's launch straight in with the first question. For the past 40 years, we've all been told that public ownership is outdated, inefficient, even impossible. For the past 10 years in particular, we've been told that public expenditure has to be severely cut back to allow the private sector, which is supposed to be more efficient, to rescue us. Now, capitalist governments in multiple countries, one after the other, are doing somersaults. So what are these new measures? It's incredible, isn't it? Mm. Just how quickly everything changes, like you've just described, and how a new normal seems to be established. Like you said, for a decade, all we've heard is that there's no money for the NHS. In fact, we've got to cut back spending. There's no money to pay people's benefits that they can actually survive on for young people's services, for older people's support, for schools to house the homeless, for firefighters, and so on. Mm. That austerity has cost lives. There's about 150,000 estimated unnecessary deaths. It caused the Grenfell tragedy and so on. And those cuts are still a major factor in what is happening in this crisis. Mm -hmm. But like you said, now the message has been completely flipped. We had the Chancellor a couple of weeks ago coming out and saying there will be no limit on what they will spend. (laughs) It is incredible. And we know there are holes in all of the announcements, really big holes, but nonetheless, this turn this flip is is absolutely incredible and we should say from the start that the socialist party really does welcome every measure that protects society from this virus that protects workers protects the vulnerable and so on both the health and the economic implications but we also have to say why this is happening and we have to issue a warning Mm. because everything that they've done has been delayed, hasn't it? Too little, too late is, I think, is a phrase that comes through a lot of the frontline workers' reports in the paper. Yes, in the socialist newspaper. That's right. And that comes from the fact that the Tories were hesitant. And in fact, that is the starting position of the defenders of capitalism, Mm. is not to act unless they feel that their right to rule is going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. That's why the idea of herd immunity came up. Let it run its course and the deaths that we then found out would be likely if that was to go ahead. I'm sure they thought it would reduce their welfare bill. Well, quite. So we welcome the measures that are taken, but we have to say that for all their spending, this remains a government of big business. Mm. And that when forced to recognise the level of the crisis, the Tories and governments around the world have had to abandon their neoliberal hands-off policies. Let the market decide has been the mantra. There is no alternative, etc., etc., in favour of state intervention and spending. A bit like wartime, actually. Mm -hmm. And the Tories have spent billions of state money 
our money, uh, to prop up their system, to prop up their system which is based upon private profit and not social need. And it's clear in every single measure, isn't it? We are not all in this together, Mm -hmm. regardless of the big headline announcements, because how come it is that workers are getting a 20% pay cut Mm -hmm. while profits are hoarded and hoarded wealth remains intact? Make big business pay. That's our approach. The thousand richest people in Britain are sitting on a cash pile of three quarters of a trillion pounds. That's the thousand richest. Why don't we have a 50% levy on that? As a start, alongside the you know, genuine nationalisation that we need, that could boost the NHS and all the things that we need, personal protection equipment, PPE and so on, incomes of the sick, the unemployed and pensioners. And we say full pay for all, whether in work or not, and that the money should go directly to the workers, not through the bosses. And that's what underlines our approach to these announcements, to this changed approach of the government, that workers mustn't be made to pay the price now, through compromises on safety, living standards or rights, or in the future, Mm. because that is something that we need to look at. So if workers aren't going to pay the price, that means making the other side pay, doesn't it? And there are two sides in society, which I think this crisis is showing. And the other side is the big business bosses. But let's look at some of the actual measures, because they are eye-watering, aren't they, in their scale? At the moment, I had two billion down, but I read this morning that it's something like 3.6 billion people are in either voluntary or enforced lockdown at this moment in time across the planet, 40% of the world's population. The general election was in December and Corbyn's anti-austerity programme was rubbished because it included billions in spending on public services. (laughs) And now that's chicken feed compared to what the Tories are implementing in a matter of weeks. Just one example... I mean, remember how much Corbyn's plan on broadband was rubbish, free free broadband, broadband, yeah. yeah. But over the weekend, the government struck a deal with telecommunications companies to remove all data allowance caps on current fixed broadband services to help families with children at home and stuff like that. Also people working remotely. Exactly, yeah, it's a big problem. Of course, we've got to say... Those companies should be nationalised, part of a plan for the economy, Mm -hmm. part of a plan for making people's lives better, under democratic working class control and management to meet need, without profit interfering, without charges being an obstacle to people accessing the services that they need. Look at these new field hospitals that have been created. Mm. Enormous new facilities. It shows the difference between... The market determining everything, you know, some of the crumbling hospitals that we've been told there is no money to invest and improve and so on. Mm -hmm. And suddenly when social need is exerting a significant pressure on the situation, these hospitals can be created. Now, they're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There's more to be done, but it shows that a government can act when it is forced to. And that's a lesson for now and also for the future very much so. Mm -hmm. And of course, these hospitals that they created are not adequate in making up the 44% of general and acute beds that have been cut since the 1980s or for the overcrowding, understaffing and crisis that are not natural occurrences in the NHS. They're not part of the NHS. They are part of the ruthless capitalist privatisation that has been pushed in the NHS by Tory and Blairite governments up until now. One of the things I read was in The Economist, they talked about how incredible it is that a virus, a ten thousandth of a millimetre in diameter, has, what they said, transformed Western democracies. (laughs) I mean, we would say that's going a little bit far in terms of, is it a transformation? But Mm. the figures and the pace are breathtaking, because in the US, the package that Trump has prepared is worth almost two trillion dollars. That's a tenth of GDP there. That's twice what they promised in 2007, 2008, when there was the world economic collapse. Mm. It's the largest fiscal stimulus in modern history. Central banks are just printing money. And, you know, the measures that have been taken in France, the government now has the power to manage prices and requisition goods. Mm-hmm. What are these measures going to do to what people think about the world Mm -hmm. because I think the question is going to arise in billions of minds of those who've been suffering poverty and hunger and insecurity if they can do it now why can't governments act in our interests in normal times why do they only do it when their system is threatened Mm. The Italian government has nationalised the country's main airline. The Spanish government has nationalised private health care. In China, government direction increased daily mask production almost six times to 116 million a day. 
Again, during the general election, one of the things that came up was that oh, EU state aid rules are going to make it impossible for Corbyn's nationalisation programme, limited as it was, to take place. But now we've seen that the European Commission has approved a 50 million euro Italian aid scheme to support the production and supply of medical devices, obviously Mm -hmm. late. But nonetheless, it shows these pieces of paper can be torn up when their system is threatened by the crisis. The capitalist class is prepared to mobilise everything to prop up their system. And another thing that I'm sure lots of listeners have been thinking is, especially the young people who've been protesting against the climate catastrophe over the last couple of years, is why can't these kind of drastic measures be taken to deal with that crisis that is looming in front of us, 12 Mm. years for the future of human health and safety as well as now? And like I said, workers are going to be asking, why can't this money be found when they were suffering austerity? And just on that austerity, because it is a factor in the crisis, services were left unprepared, people were left more vulnerable because of low pay and their living standards going down. But also, what was austerity? Because we were told it was necessary, weren't we? After balance the books. Balance the books, exactly. But we in the Socialist Party and in the Socialist paper always made it absolutely clear austerity is a lie because the defenders of capitalism, big business and their representatives in governments around the world, they chose to do it rather than having to. And it's the logic of their system, isn't it? Mm. That capitalism is a crisis-ridden system and it hasn't been able to fully recover from that crisis. The debt has grown and so on. There's loads of statistics that we could give since the crisis of 2007-2008. And that crisis itself was caused by capitalism itself, not the lie that we were told that it was Oh, too much was spent on... Credit cards and yeah. having your own home. Yeah, and selfish nur- people. Yeah, and schools and nurses and nurseries and stuff like that. Luxuries. Yeah, exactly. But it's really serious, isn't it? Because lives have been lost. Suffering has taken place as a result of that austerity. And governments had a choice. They could choose to make big business pay, and the bankers who caused it or make the working class pay through austerity. And obviously, those pro-capitalist governments did the latter. They nationalised the banks, but they did it to save their system. Mm. They didn't do it to create cheap loans and mortgages for working class people trying to maintain their living standards and the ability to work and so on. And we have paid in brutal cuts. And that's what they're doing now, isn't it? Acting to save their system. And like I said, you know, just to recap, we welcome the measures that protect workers, but we have to warn that they are going to try to make us pay for all of that spending in the future and that we've got to fight to develop actual socialist policies and planning to meet society's need, not big businesses drive for profit. So there's a fight coming then. But even right now, there are still big shortages of equipment like ventilators, the vaccine which is still in development, other treatments like antiviral drugs, personal protective equipment, PPE. This is a scandal in the health service and in all the other major sectors which are still mobilised during this pandemic. How can we sort all of that out? Because for decades we've been told that private competition is essential or we won't be able to fill gaps in producing key goods, which the state could never possibly plan because that doesn't work. Or that private competition is essential because without that spur to make more money than the next guy, there will never be any technological progress. So if all that's true, some people might ask, isn't centralisation and state control right now putting all of this at risk? I don't think many people are going to ask that. (laughs) But look... James, you and I, we work for the Socialist Party, so we're not going to pretend to be any kind of experts on the question of ventilator production or vaccine production or test production. Mm. But I think there are some points that we can definitely make. And on Thursday, eight o'clock, we are going to be and lots of listeners are going to be clapping for health workers like Mm -hmm. they did last week when it rang out across the country. But the Tories did it as well, didn't they? They stood out. Oh, it's sickening. It was watching be- Johnson come out and do it. That's right, because people have been sharing on social media the footage of the Tories in 2017 cheering, not the healthcare workers, but cheering because they'd blocked a pay rise for nurses mm. at that point. And people know that the NHS was left unprepared for this situation by the cuts and also the privatisation that was carried out by Tory and Blairite governments since Thatcher. Because we have to have a memory, don't we? The first coronavirus case was not the start of this crisis. Mm -hmm. In November 2019, none of England's 118 major accident and emergency departments met their targets. None. And that was the first time ever 
in the history of the NHS. And if NHS funding had risen in line with average increases before 2010, its budget would be 35 billion higher now. So that puts in context the amount that's being put in now. Mm -hmm. And as well as that, every year, tens of billions of pounds are being paid to big business in PFI payments for the NHS. So that's the private finance initiative whereby the private sector bills it using public money and then rents it back to the public sector so you have to pay for it twice over. That's right. I mean, it is a scam and a scandal. So the first point I think we have to say is private profit out of our health system. Mm -hmm. There is no place for it. And I think, you know, it'd be very hard to defend that right now, but it is the situation that we're in. And imagine if that amount of money had been ploughed into staff, into improvements, into investment in crisis preparation, which has scandalously not occurred despite the advice given to the government instead of going to shareholders. Just one figure. I think Richard Branson has become quite a figure of hate in this situation. Mm -hmm. And rightly so, because in five years, he clocked up £2 billion worth of NHS contracts, about 400 contracts because of the government's policies of bidding and so on. And we have to say it's in the nature of capitalist production, production for profit, to try to not pay for things that might happen. Mm -hmm. It's not just an accident that this happened. We see it in the fire service, don't we? Firefighters get laid off because oh, there might not be a fire. Well, there might be a Grenfell. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw. It's called red tape. It's called waste. But no, that is preparation for the fact that lives might need to be looked after, might need to be saved and so on. It's about the protection of society, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But capitalism, production for profit, doesn't allow for that. And that's what we have to expose. So they look at the situation and say, we can definitely make money out of this, but we can't definitely make money out of the other. So because we base ourselves on profit, we have to go for the thing which we can definitely make money out of to the exclusion of everything else. That's right, that's right. And, you know, it's the issue across the board, isn't it? Organising society for profit instead of social need is the question that I think is being posed by this situation. And what we've seen is that it's one or the other, isn't it? Capitalism has meant the wealth of the richest going up while billions live in poverty and have their living standards reduced. And also that capitalism has made people more vulnerable. I mean, Look at the heartbreaking, heart-wrenching and rage-inspiring scenes in India of those day labourers who are already poor and struggling day to day, being expelled and forced to walk hundreds of miles home because of the coronavirus lockdown being implemented by the brutal Modi government there, treated like rubbish by a capitalist system, really. I mean, literally covered in bleach, aren't they, when they cross borders by the police? Exactly. Look at the scenes in the US. The richest country on this planet. And I saw a picture where they'd marked out spaces like a car park on a concrete platform for the homeless to have self-isolation. That is what the wealth of society being mobilised for profit and not for social need means. Because we know there's homes. We know there's resources on the planet. We know there's the potential to produce more. And those homeless people, by the way, that's in Las Vegas, in the shadow of these enormous towers of huge wealth. That's right. That is exactly right. And in the question that you asked, you know, it's absolutely clear that the way things are produced under capitalism has come under the spotlight when we need ventilators, when we need personal protection equipment, when we need vaccines, and we need them urgently. Mm. And... Test, it's on the front page of the new issue of The Socialist. It's been really well highlighted in The Socialist paper. Because the Tory government has been operating on a wing and a prayer when it comes to testing, haven't they? You keep getting these announcements. Any minute now, we're going to start testing frontline health workers. Any minute now, we're going to be up to thousands of tests a day, 10, 25. They give the numbers, but they haven't actually produce the goods. No, it's always jammed tomorrow as well. The date keeps moving further and further forward. Exactly, exactly. And all they've done is say, look, we're appealing to business to assist rather than taking production into democratic public ownership to suit the needs of society, to Mm. protect society's health and to protect the health workers and all the workers, the care workers and all of those workers, the bin workers, everybody... They are allowing profit to continue to impede provision. Mm -hmm. This morning I was listening to the radio and there was a care home boss saying hand sanitizer had gone up nine times the price that they were normally charged. (sighs) Masks have gone up a thousand percent. 
And that is just production for profit. Mm. That is not about making sure that those care homes, the workers aren't more vulnerable and the people in them aren't more vulnerable, but it's like seeing a market and trying to make a profit out of a situation. Mm-hmm. And also just-in-time production sounds good, doesn't it? Get things done just in time. (laughs) But it's about minimising costs to suit the current existing market, not the potential or even real social need. And now it means that we don't have a test, we don't have a vaccine, and we don't have enough ventilators. Mm -hmm. And just on the ventilators, everyone probably knows this now, but it's horrendous. One of the most dangerous symptoms of COVID-19 is the way that it attacks the lungs of those infected. And that means that some patients need a ventilator to help them breathe until their lungs recover. But there's a dire shortage of those machines in hospitals in every country on the planet. And intensive care units are going to be overwhelmed, already starting to be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. In the US, for example, there is something like 20,000 ventilators. And the potential for a million people to need them. Jesus. And they are specialised machines. Now, there's all sorts of work being done to come up with cheaper ways of making them, easier ways of making them. Doctors are trying to look at whether they can be serviced to treat more than one person at a time and so on. Mm -hmm. But they need to suit a patient's specific needs. They need trained workers, etc., etc., We need ventilators. We need production of ventilators. We need, like the general electric workers in the US were being threatened with the sack because the company decided they could save potentially a billion pounds by mothballing the country and laying off their workers. Mm -hmm. They've been protesting to demand that their skills and the technology in that factory is turned to ventilator production. That's what the workers (laughs) are are doing. But it's not just... Where are the bosses in this picture? Why aren't they doing it? Exactly. But it's not just... The production of the ventilators, it's also the question of the collaboration and the cooperation to work out where they're going to be needed, to make sure that the staff who can run them are with them. What does that mean? One thing that struck me was when I read a doctor in the US writing in the New York Times about what is needed. The doctor himself said, he said, we need a plan. And that's absolutely clear, isn't it? That if you have states competing nation states competing the british government keeps saying oh we're going to get a thousand ventilators 500 from the u.s and 500 from israel what well exactly (laughs) that's not production for need that's still that's just different capitalist classes robbing each other exactly at the expense of the whole world population exactly and that's because production for profit is an obstacle Even a writer in the New York Post, which is not a left paper, said that ventilators only cost about $35,000 to make, and they described that as peanuts to the elites. But because the US, and this is a quote, but because the US healthcare industry is about making money, no one heeded warnings going back more than a decade that the country should stockpile the machines. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? The failure to plan for social need because profit came first. I know I keep repeating that point, but I think it's just so blatant in terms of what we're talking about, the disaster that capitalist production is. And like those general electric workers, it's workers who point to the potential for production and are willing to do what is needed. Mm. And a socialist plan of production could be national and international, couldn't it? And Mm -hmm. it could combine laboratory research with modern purpose-built factories and, crucially, public ownership Mm -hmm. and investment instead of private ownership and shareholder profit. Another figure keeps going through my head, James, which is in the past decade of austerity, the shareholders of the 100 biggest corporations in Britain, they doubled their take to £110 billion a year. Imagine if that was part of a socialist plan of production instead Mm -hmm. of going into their profits. And testing is crucial. All the medical experts, the WHO, everyone says so. We don't have to spell that out here. Prince Charles got a test. Boris Johnson got a test. And actually, so they should. But so should everybody. So should all the frontline workers in the NHS, in the care homes, the bin workers, the social workers... Everybody should be able to access a test. It would take an enormous amount of stress out of the situation, but also it has been shown to be very effective. Germany has been testing 70,000 people a day. And in Britain, we're still not got up to 10,000 people a day. Mm -hmm. And like we said, that's despite the Tory claims. And health workers are still not getting it. So there aren't enough tests. And again, profits are a factor. One figure that really illustrated that for me was how the shares for one company that said it could produce a $10 test 
went up 600% in two days. Mm. This is not about doing what we need. This still remains within the confines of production for profit, and that is an obstacle. So that's why we're demanding the requisitioning of those factories, of laboratories. What, laboratories, exactly. All the resources should be turned towards this, like wartime, mm -hmm. but under democratic working class control and management. That's what we need. So not the control of the bosses but the control of the workers who are the ones saying, actually, we can turn this factory into something which makes masks or ventilators. Please let us do it. But the bosses, ruled by profit, are refusing to do so. Yeah, and that is a, also a block to the collaboration, which is necessary. Yes, and that's an interesting point, because you've had scientists, haven't you, saying, well, look, now that we've got this pandemic and we've been forced to do it, suddenly all the private research facilities, all the big universities, they're all sharing their information, which previously was a closely guarded trade secret, mm -hmm. or was behind very expensive paywalls in technical medical journals and scientific publications and so on. And a whole load of it has just been thrown open to try to find a way out of this existential crisis. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, this is great. This mm -hmm. is what I got into science for. Mm -hmm. This is how it should operate. Mm -hmm. But on the basis of competition to make more than the next guy, it simply doesn't work that way. So the abolition of trade secrets, a traditional demand of the workers' movement and of Marxism, is absolutely essential. And it's, it's even partly taking place in this situation. If this can allow us to actually get our way medically out of this crisis in this time, why shouldn't that be applied to every problem which society has, rather than just to this one? And then we go back to the, all the mess which we had before of duplication of effort, of not being able to get the ideas of each other and so on. So national states may be extending their influence, but as we've already touched on, this isn't a national problem, it's a world problem. Yeah. So Gordon Brown, who's a former right-wing Labour Prime Minister, he even, a week or two ago, he called for a temporary world government. The word plan, as you've mentioned, is reappearing in contrast to the unplanned nature of the capitalist market. That's why the word plan is being used. Mm -hmm. Now, socialists stand for international economic planning. Is this possible? Absolutely. We stand for international economic planning. Socialist international <laughs> economic planning under the democratic control and management of the working class. And that means, unlike Gordon Brown, not plans to bail out the capitalist system and then make the working class pay, which is what happened after his measures in 2007, 2008. Yeah, well, like you mentioned the nationalisation of the banks. In reality, they nationalised the debt and kept the profitable bits of the banks in private hands, didn't they? Exactly. But I think you're right that in this situation... It's so obvious that it's international, isn't it? It's so obvious that the virus doesn't respect boundaries and so on, and that international planning is clearly vital. And I read about a US doctor, actually, who was webcasting to 2,000 people in 39 countries as medical workers around the world. Like you were saying previously, it's natural instinct for people who want to expand human knowledge mm -hmm. to want to collaborate. But it's the <laughs> nature of capitalist production and even the universities under capitalism to pit people against each other and waste actual human knowledge and resources in that way. Mm. So that kind of international collaboration does make sense. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, it's asked doctors to collaborate, to submit anonymised COVID-19 patient records to its global database, because building up a picture, sharing that info, it's obvious. And if they list the drugs they've prescribed, the procedures carried out and the outcomes, that can help everybody to understand it. Mm -hmm. But in this article I read, it said it had received fewer contributions than hoped. And I think that probably is partly because collaboration is just not normal under capitalism. Mm. It isn't built into the system. We're having to start this now because it's counter to everything that's gone before. It isn't established. Competition and secrecy instead are the name of the game when profits are the priority and not social need. And that leads in everything from washing powder production to drugs as well, to duplication, to waste and to inefficiency. And that's one of the reasons why the capitalist system, the capitalist mode of production, makes this crisis so much worse. Mm. And like we said, Gordon Brown, he's referring to the situation 2007-2008 when the world governments came together to act to put a floor under the world economic crisis with the huge amount of government spending 
as we've seen in the US, for example, much less even than today. But they did quantitative easing, they did bank bailouts, etc., etc. They acted to save their system from a crisis that arose from the contradictions in their system, and then they made us pay. So it's all very well Gordon Brown saying that now, but we have to remember what his purpose was in 2007, 2008, because austerity started under his government. Mm. And Labour stood for re-election in 2010 on the basis of promising cuts worse than Thatcher. So that was uh, what, what happened then. And today, even that level of cooperation is just not going to happen. A coordinated response on that scale from capitalist governments around the world is made impossible by the international tensions that exist today. Mm-hmm. Actually, they're partly the consequence of what came after 2007, 2008. But you don't have to say more, really, do we, then? Look at Trump, look at Bolsonaro, look at Modi, look at Johnson, and so on. Even Macron in France. Macron in France, exactly. And there's changes, isn't there? Because Back then, the US was the dominant world power. We produced a book, the Socialist Party produced a book in 2006 called Marxism in Today's World. Mm. Everyone should read it, actually, because it's a really good guide for understanding the contradictions within capitalism and the tasks for the working class in the fight for socialism. But in that book, it talked about the impact of the rise of China and the geopolitical as well as economic competition in particular of China to American imperialism. And today, capitalist world relations are transformed and are a factor in this crisis and also an obstacle to the resolution. The EU, you know, there's been calls for collaboration on an EU level. Mm. Italy made an appeal to the EU, got nothing. Mm -hmm. Didn't the EU just announce a lot of money for the Italian banks, though? They have announced it now, but it was very late coming. And Mm. also, there's been a huge amount of disagreement between the countries in the south of Europe who are suffering, Spain and Italy... And uh, exactly Greece, uh, precisely, and Germany and so on, which are not. And we've had to explain many times what the EU is, that it's a bosses club, Mm -hmm. that it isn't a bringing together of people in solidarity. Mm. But in the last analysis, it is a brutal arrangement, a vehicle for driving through the interests of the capitalist class. And we saw that in Greece, didn't we? We Mm -hmm. saw the absolute trashing of the living conditions of millions of working class people in Greece in the aftermath of 2007-2008. Just to defend the banks and the richer EU countries. That's right. And that's why it prevents a challenge to nationalisation, actually. One that a workers' government would have to fight to overcome. It could overcome it, but it would be something that had to be fought. Mm. Capitalism cannot overcome the narrow limits of the nation-state and organise the productive forces on a European level or a world level. So this crisis does, like you asked, point to the need for socialist international collaboration, which is a a completely different order. And there's a stark contrast, isn't there, between the handling of the coronavirus crisis in different parts of the world, because we've got in the US, you know, Trump, first of all, saying it's a democratic hoax and, you know, not taking it seriously at all, Bolsonaro calling it a case of the sniffles and so on. And then on the (laughs) other hand, we've seen China, which is not socialism, no. very much not socialism. That requires workers' democracy, obviously, which doesn't exist there. But it is a you unique... You wouldn't have billionaires either. Well, exactly. But it is a unique state capitalist economy with the remnants of the bureaucratic Stalinist regime which existed in the past. And it shines a light on what is possible, despite the initial cover-ups, obviously, which are part of a lack of transparency by it not being a workers' state and so on. And those cover-ups have done the regime enormous damage. But... Nonetheless, the Chinese state was able to build emergency hospitals within two weeks early on, not forced to do it at a late stage like the Nightingale hospitals here, Mm. although obviously the workers involved did suffer slave-like conditions. And they were also able to dispatch doctors from around the country to the worst affected areas. It also ensured that food distribution network was put in place, which would have cut across some of the panic that people have had in the supermarkets and Mm -hmm. so on, understandable panic. And also Cuba, which despite bureaucratic planning and partial inroads made in the direction of capitalist restoration there, it has used one of the currently most effective drugs in treating those most afflicted by the virus, interferon alpha 2b. I've only read the word, I've not pronounced it previously. (laughs) And also, I think many of us will have read the incredible articles about the doctors being dispatched all over the world, including to Europe, to assist in treating the sick in Italy, for example. So I think that kind of shows us a little bit of how international 
collaboration on the basis of solidarity will be so different to international competition, which is what we've got today. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But of course, it's only possible, isn't it, once you've taken profit out of the question. Exactly. Because you cannot have collaboration on the basis of profit, because if you're giving all this stuff away, then all it takes is one other competing interest, which is privately owned and trying to extract profit, to say, thanks very much, we're not going to give as much back to you as we're going to take from you. And the whole thing falls apart, and every boss and every capitalist ruling class in every country around the world is making that calculation and going, this is impossible. And so the capitalist system is simply incapable of creating that kind of economic plan in a way that socialist societies could very easily create and, in fact, would have to create. That's right. Cuba is very interesting as well because it's had a whole number of outbreaks in the past of dengue fever Mm -hmm. and it's responded with quarantines and Mm -hmm. lockdowns. Now, again, those are not under democratic control. It's not a democratic worker state, Cuba. Mm -hmm. However... Because it has that planned economy, Mm -hmm. there wasn't that risk of the bosses losing all their profit and the whole economy going into a profound recession, Mm -hmm. which is already happening in all the capitalist countries at the moment, because it was on the basis of planning rather than market competition. So again, that shows the possibilities which there are in planning. That's right. And the very fact that this tiny island was able, in 1986, it created interferon. Mm -hmm. It's been around a while. It's widely used across the world to treat viruses. And that was on the basis of having a nationalised pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. Now, the Tories keep announcing massive new funding boosts, almost on a daily basis, in fact. But every announcement they make misses the point. Mm. So you've already said earlier on that the 80% wage subsidy, well, that means a 20% wage cut. Mm. And the employers are still firing people anyway. Mm. And this is not just in Britain. There are a lot of layoffs in Britain. But in the United States, for example, record-breaking layoffs, almost 3 million people in a week. Mm. That is five times the previous record. Mm. Now, for weeks in Britain, there was nothing for millions of self-employed workers. And now, in the past few days, they've announced 80% income protection there as well, based, by the way, on the average earnings over the last year. So if you had a bad year last year, but normally do pretty well, you're still not doing very well out of that. Mm. And it's still a 20% pay cut on top of that. But there are no payments, even after that, for three months. Mm. Hundreds of billions of pounds have been promised in stimulus, trillions in the United States of dollars. But this is mostly going on propping up corporate profits. It's not mostly going on funding essential public services, although there is some increase there as well. The bosses in firm after firm are ignoring the advice on hygiene and Mm. safety. Just in the latest issue, by the way, of the socialist newspaper, we've got an anonymous report from a distribution centre worker who said only in the past few days have they got hand sanitizers. they're still doing training of hundreds of new staff without social distancing, and they've had a confirmed case in there, Mm -hmm. and the workers are saying, hang on, have we got it now? Mm -hmm. Has the food we've distributed, has that gone out with coronavirus on it? Mm -hmm. The bosses are not taking this seriously, and it's taken strikes or the threat of strikes to force them to comply. So the current central control by the state seems... Partly ineffective, certainly incompetent. So I think people will be asking, hang on, you know, is central planning really the answer here? Look at the mess. So is there a way for central planning to actually be responsive Mm. to the real needs of services and workers? Yeah, I mean, what you've said there is absolutely right. Without doubt, the government is running behind the needs of working class people because they act in the interests of big business, of privatisers and the banks. And like you say, the announcements have got huge holes in them, like on evictions, for example. But the demands from the front line, from the workers, keep kind of rising up and the Tories have no way of ignoring them if they want to (laughs) stay in power, really. And by the way, there is already some speculation, I saw it in the Financial Times and other newspapers as well, about whether Johnson's mishandling of the crisis in the early stages is going to see him out of power sooner rather than later. But anyway, the point is that demands are coming up from people on the ground, from the working class, Mm -hmm. postal workers... They've walked out in a number of areas, haven't they, against being forced to increase their vulnerability by delivering junk mail. I mean, what a <laughs> brutal example of like workers' safety being sacrificed for companies that probably aren't even 
producing the stuff maybe or selling the stuff even that they're sending this junk mail out for Mm. but it's those workers who've had to organize in the workplaces that's why in our workers charter we've raised the idea that in every workplace trade unions and if they're not organized in the unions workers should elect democratic health and safety committees to work out what the demands are of the workplace to keep the workforce safe that's Mm -hmm. how it's got to be organized in a workplace basis isn't it you can't rely on the boss to act in the interest of the workers. In New York, we've seen that really brutally, where an Amazon worker has been fired because he was a trade unionist organising against the unsafe working conditions there. Absolutely horrendous. And like you said, in The Socialist, we've had fantastic reports from workers who are fighting to protect themselves collectively. And that goes for health and safety, But as we've already touched on with the General Electric example in the US, those workers wanting to produce ventilators instead of having the factory mothballed, it's also about how their skills and their technology and the technique that exists already could be used and could be built on for society's needs. Mm. In The Socialist, we've covered the, not new news, but something that's really important for the socialist movement is the memory of what's been done before. And one of those, I think, really good examples is the Lucas Plan, which was an event in 1976. And in essence, it was workers who were faced with losing their jobs in the face of automation. Through their trade union, they came up with a plan to use the skills of the workforce and the technology to produce something like 129 different products that would be socially useful using the existing machinery and the workforce. And that was an arms factory, Lucas, as well. Well, precisely, exactly. So it's about how can society's resources serve society. It's not very complicated, is it? But (laughs) it's anathema to capitalist production. That's the problem for profit. Today... Incredibly, the railways have effectively been nationalised, haven't they now? At least temporarily, after the government suspended rail franchise agreements to avoid train companies collapsing because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. A few months ago, we were told by the Tories and the Blairites alike that it was policies like rail (laughs) nationalisation that made Corbyn unfit for government. Yeah, yeah. We welcomed Corbyn's anti-austerity programme and we welcomed the nationalisation aspects of it but we did say that it needs to go further that we need to build on that and I think this comes on to your question about centrally planning because to solve the problems faced by both people and the environment requires more than just removing the profit motive from the key planks of the economy, so not just ending the rail franchises, Mm -hmm. welcome though that is. It means removing the grip of big business from society altogether. Mm. A still relevant phrase that comes from the 2007-2008 crisis. Big business and the banking system are a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity (laughs) relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money that's why we've got to get rid of it isn't it it's an obstacle to who was that mark thomas no it was uh, i can't remember the name of the writer but it was (laughs) quite commonly used at the time of the crisis but because it's so clear when you think about it that that's what's happening isn't it it's a blockage and it's sucking the blood out of society instead of like allowing it to take oxygen around the population and to solve the problems that are faced by humanity and the environment. Mm. So that's why we say we've got to go further than just individual measures here and there. Mm -hmm. It's got to be much more. A central demand for the movement that we raise every single week in the socialist paper and that we've got to discuss and to fight for it to be taken up as widely as possible is the nationalisation of the top 150 companies that dominate the economy. Those commanding heights that would give you a lever on the economy, that would provide the basis to begin democratically planning production. So why 150? Because we estimate that that is where the power in the economy is held. We don't need to go around nationalising shops or little small shops. business. Little shops. Yeah, yeah, Tesco's is different. I mean, look at the profits that Tesco's been taking. Look at the power that you mm. could have to distribute food in a fair and equitable way. Mm-hmm. Take away the production of unhealthy food. Concentrate it on meeting society's needs much more. But we don't have to do that to the corner shop, do we? No. We want to be able to take the 150 top companies 
that dominate the economy into democratic public ownership because then we could have the a handle on starting to plan. Because that would be about four fifths of economic activity, wouldn't it? Exactly. The top 150 That's right. or so in the country. Yeah. So that would be a real commanding position for exactly. a public sector. And it would mean that you could start to plan production and the use of resources without the interference of the 0.1% that vampire squid. <laughs> mm. There's all sorts of things that are said about why this wouldn't work, wouldn't be fair on shareholders and so on, and we've got to be absolutely clear. We've got an answer to that, don't we? Mm. No ordinary people will suffer from nationalisation because compensation will be paid, but on the basis of proven need. Not a penny to those fat cats. Like Richard uh, Branson. Exactly. And elected committees accountable to the working class could make the call on how that happens, couldn't they? So that's an interesting question then. Elected committees accountable to the working class because you point out that there's been, in effect, a sort of nationalisation of the railways in Britain. However, the government is still paying those suspended franchisees, the private companies, a managing fee to control the reduced network coverage. So who's really in control there? Is that the way to do it? Absolutely not. (laughs) That is not the way to do it. Because, yeah, nationalisation then poses the question of, who has a say in what happens? It's not only taking it out of the hands of private owners, is it? It's mm. about democratic oversight of industry, of production, of a socialist government as well that would be necessary, that all of those in positions of leadership would have to be subject to democratic oversight, to the right of recall, to regular elections, and in general oversight by the working class. It's not, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere that we went into this crisis with an historic crisis of legitimacy of the capitalist political parties. It's because people Mm. don't trust them. Mm -hmm. One of the measures that socialists stand for in every area of society is democratic control by working class people. And that means the right to remove, replace your leaders. It's not a new idea. It comes from (laughs) the French Revolution. but uh, Or even before. And it would be essential to a socialist plan. Mm. It would be essential. And there's other aspects to it as well. I mean, just briefly... In the course of the general election, when Corbyn was raising nationalisation of some elements of electricity production, for example, you had SSE and stuff moving some of their affairs to other countries out of fear that there might be a Corbyn government which started to nationalise those profiteering vultures. And we said that their action showed that a socialist government would also have to act quickly to combine nationalisation with measures to introduce capital controls and control of foreign trade. And I think that links to the nature of international collaboration that you were pointing to Mm. earlier, how it would have to be a democratic process as well. It has to be like that. Those big bosses moving their resources out of the country, they're not going to move them to a socialist country, are they? No, exactly. So socialist countries would have nothing to fear from opening their borders to some kind of collaboration on a democratic basis. Precisely. So yeah, so that's the nature of a socialist plan. So the problem with what the Tories are doing is, first of all, that it's completely piecemeal. Mm. That, of course, they're never going to take the banks and the big corporations into public ownership because they represent profit interests. So we need to go much further in terms of the scope if we're going to really have a resolution, not just to this crisis, but to all the social crises. Mm. But then... Also, this issue of who controls things. So not just the old bosses, which is how the Tories like to nationalise things. You know, when they, well, it was New Labour, supposedly nationalised the banks, but it was still the Fred, the Shreds and the various other (laughs) big bankers were still in control of the whole outfit. And that was true in previous periods of nationalisation as well. So not the old bosses. And not temporarily. (laughs) And not temporarily. But but also not the Whitehall mandarins either, not just distant bureaucrats who have no idea of the real situation on the ground, both what the workforce needs and what the actual consumers and service users need. So this issue of democratic working class control and management, Mm. like you say, what does that mean? It means election on the basis of actually the workforce itself having control Mm -hmm. in Mm industries, because they're the real experts, as we are learning again and again Mm -hmm. in this crisis. Mm -hmm. But that's balanced against the wider working class, service users, representatives of the broader trade union movement. And in order to achieve central planning, those representatives of central government as well, a socialist central government will be the only one which could actually achieve this sort of thing. That's right. That's right. So... Even capitalist commentators have come out in their press saying that socialist measures are necessary, at least temporarily. Mm -hmm. This level of state intervention is unprecedented in peacetime. But is it socialism? No. (laughs) Is that what we say more? (laughs) If you would, yep. In The Socialist, we've quoted, like you said, a pro-capitalist writer. It was writing in The Telegraph, not a socialist paper. 
And they sort of let the cat out of the bag a little bit because he said, to avert socialism, we must briefly become socialists. Mm. We must spend whatever it takes to save free market liberalism. That doesn't sound very socialist. No, exactly. It's about saving the capitalist system. Socialist measures in capitalist interests, and that is not socialism. No, socialism for the rich. (laughs) Exactly. We've had that before, haven't we? And we've paid for it as well. And I thought it might be useful to extremely briefly, and this is not a full picture, but to look at what capitalism is, because I think a lot of people have been thinking about this over the last decade, especially because of the ongoing crisis of capitalism. But like we said, capitalism is a system based on production for profit, Mm. not for social need. And it's a system that is riddled with contradictions. Capitalism when it came into being, it socialised production, didn't it? It created the working class and that it brought workers together in factories and so on and linked them together in production. But instead of, as previously, production being an individual thing from start to finish of a product or whatever, capitalism links workers through collective production in the factories and actually throughout the world to a certain extent. Which is much more efficient. But the product is owned by the boss. Yeah. And that really does create enormous contradictions and leads to crisis. But another contradiction of capitalism is between the nation state and the global market. It's full of contradictions, and Mm. that's something that we can discuss in a future podcast. Mm -hmm. Capitalism was, as Karl Marx explained, a system that came into being through revolutionary struggle, but as a system that was built on blood and bones of slavery. It's Mm. a system that is fundamentally based on exploitation of Mm -hmm. the working class, the vast majority of society, by the capitalist class, which is a tiny handful of the people who own the factories, the banks, etc. Tony Blair famously said, we're all middle class now, there's no working class, but that is another of these lies that have existed for a while, that have been smashed out of the water, isn't it? It's made much clearer who the working class is, even then a few weeks ago, probably for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. that it's everyone who works. Mm -hmm. The clue's in the name, isn't it? (laughs) Key worker is a worker. Everyone who works to keep society going, shop workers, bin workers, health workers, care workers, teachers, electricity workers, sewage, water, uh, car workers, workers exactly, manufacturing, food production, farm workers, etc. Car workers who could be ventilator workers and Mm. stuff like that as well. And that we're all connected through our own workplaces, but also, like we said, that there's a division of labour that connects us as well. And that's important because what we do in life and how we see ourselves has an impact on how we see society. And Marx pointed out that when capitalism brought workers together and connected them, it means that we've a shared experience, a collective experience of being exploited as well by the capitalist class, and that we're physically together in the workplaces Mm. And Marx said that the collective interest in ending exploitation and therefore capitalism made the working class the potential grave diggers of the capitalist system. Mm. And that's really important as well, isn't it? Because it's clear. Who's Mm. been on the news saying personal protection equipment is needed? It's not the bosses, is it, saying, God, we can't go on unless our workers are safe. It's the workers themselves saying that. Yeah, although actually a lot of the news has simply been ignoring the question in order to defend the the capitalists and the Tory government. Quite, quite. The news that we can glean that is the real news. But it's workers, basically, who are defending society's safety. Mm -hmm. Who's having to act in the workplace to insist that safety comes before profit? Workers. Look Mm -hmm. at the bin workers. Look at the teachers in East London who are having to organise to push back against the bosses to say how to organise both to keep the children of key workers and themselves safe. Look at the shop workers It's been them that's led the social distancing in the supermarkets, by and large, not the bosses who just want to hear the ring, ring, ring of the cash tills. But like I said, that's why we're saying in every workplace that we need a Democratic Trade Union Health and Safety Committee to represent the collective and shared needs of the workers Mm -hmm. and act collectively to push for them against the bosses who are putting profits first. And that's part of the basis of socialism, really, isn't it? But on a national and an international scale, that democratic working class control and management of society and planning, not just the chaos of putting individual needs first or even on the basis of the nation state. And because socialism is a system based on organising society collectively around need, planning around need, 
that means the overwhelming majority of the population and the environment can be protected, not just the profits of individuals. Yeah. And talking about individual needs, by the way, it couldn't be clearer right now that the only way to actually satisfy individual needs for more than 99% of the population is collective organising. But actually, when Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society, she didn't mean, you know... It's she often... compared the coronavirus crisis. Well, she did, she did. What she went on to say is that individuals have a responsibility to each other and to everyone. And that sounds lovely. But she said that to mean there is no collective role for people coming together to organise, that each individual has to have responsibility for society as a whole. Mm. It's insane. Mm. And the insanity is writ large now. Millions of workers are now stuck at home with or without pay. Millions more are still having to go in with heightened risks to themselves and to their loved ones. What can workers do to organise, to protect themselves during this crisis, but also to prepare to say no going back at the other end? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, actually, and one that lots of people are going to be thinking about, like you say. And we do want people to write in, don't we, with their thoughts on these questions. Yeah. In the Socialist Party's charter, workers' charter that we've produced, I mentioned it already, we point to the need for working class involvement in the measures to respond to the crisis. Everything that we've said today, everything that people are seeing, it shows 100%, doesn't it, that we cannot trust big business or their representatives, i.e. the Tories. And for that reason, like I said, we've raised the need for trade union health and safety committees in every workplace to agree joint actions needed to guarantee safety. Elements of this have already been proven necessary, like the way the RMT union had to demand more trains on London Underground to prevent the overcrowding. Yeah, Uh, because the boss had actually reduced the number of trains. Any idiot can tell you that means the remaining trains will have more people on them. The union had to step in. Exactly. And that was workers fighting for society's interest against an employer motivated by the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with shop workers, like you said, and so on. But it's on a other scale as well, isn't it? We've also raised in that charter the need for democratic trade union oversight of any government or private sector emergency measures taken to deal with the coronavirus crisis, such as the restrictions that there are on public assemblies. I mean, we want people to be safe. We do absolutely respect the social distancing, those kind of measures for safety. But we also recognise that these can be used when it comes to issues of strikes and food rationing. We've seen start of food riots in Italy as people Mm. panic that big business can't be relied on to take people's needs into account. I think the last podcast dealt with some of these questions in detail about the trade union role, and I really recommend that. We also call on councils because every other day I get an email from the head of my local council saying, you know, we're all coming together to do our best. But councils have power Mm. and councils have budgets. Mm -hmm. And most councils have got cuts budget. So we're calling on, I mean, it's ABC, isn't it? But we're calling on the councils to scrap their existing cuts budgets. Some Socialist Party branches are writing to the councils to do this. But now and in the future, actually, we can see the money's there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The cuts were, like we always said, were not necessary. Hundreds Uh, of millions in reserves in many councils. That's right. Empty homes can be used to house the homeless. Mm-hmm. Never can that be disagreed with again. Solutions to childcare, etc., etc. I saw a Socialist Party member point out on social media the way that councils are basically having to, in effect, reverse the cuts that they made to things like Meals on Wheels because those services are necessary and they were necessary before this crisis then absolutely necessary now to support the elderly in their homes and we fought those cuts and we're going to fight to maintain any gains that are won now working class struggle is necessary to do that and we'd say to councils use those reserves like you mentioned millions of pounds use the borrowing powers that they have before and now Mm. but also just tell the Tory government if they demand those cuts are made no Mm -hmm. That's what any representative of the working class would do, isn't it? That's what Liverpool Council did in the 1980s, which we've talked about many times, led by socialists, predecessor of the Socialist Party. And that's what's necessary now, a struggle to defend working class people. And then thinking about life beyond the crisis is hard. Like you say, prepare for no going back at the other end. It's hard to think about being out of this situation now we're we're in it because it feels a bit like a parallel universe. But you're absolutely right to raise this question about the future. The working class must think about what comes afterwards because the capitalist class is thinking about what comes afterwards. Mm. The Economist magazine 
some listeners may read it or not, but <laughs> what we all know about it is that it believes in limited government and open markets. Mm-hmm. It's a capitalist voice, isn't it? Yeah, of the old capitalist orthodoxy of neoliberalism. That's right. And exactly. And because of that, their fear, they say, is that after crises, the state doesn't give up all the ground it has taken. And I think what they're thinking about there is, for example, what happened after the Second World War, Mm -hmm. where major measures of state intervention were taken. And workers came back from the war and said, we're not going to go back to the market dictating whether you get to see a doctor when you're sick, whether a pregnant woman in childbirth gets access to a doctor or not. And by the way, what this has exposed about women's place in society Mm. is incredible in terms of the lack of services for domestic violence, which was an issue before this crisis, but also the cuts in midwives are brutal. You know, the fact that antenatal and postnatal support is going to be cut is a major issue. Mm -hmm. But that was a big part of what was in workers' minds coming back from the Second World War. Obviously, they had the Soviet Union with the planned economy in their heads as well, but that they were not going to go back to their lives being determined by the needs of the market. And they fought for the NHS, Mm -hmm. and they fought for public services, for council housing, for workers' rights, for health and safety at work, and so on. And there's really important lessons in that, which I think we can maybe explore in a future podcast in a bit more detail about Mm -hmm. how we think about how to maintain the gains that have been made And we've talked in this podcast about working class control and management, the democratic structures necessary for that and so on, not handing nationalised industries and services back to the bosses to run things in the same way, the profit first way that got us into this mess. And these measures, like I said, must be under democratic control now and also beyond the crisis. How do we achieve that when the bosses are making it clear that their plan is for things to go back to what they would call normal. Mm. Us suffering, them exploiting us, the austerity, the shareholder profits, the environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. That's what the Financial Times, another capitalist paper, was saying when it wrote, for the country to recover from this crisis, companies will need to be able to rely on their workers to help the economy restart. (laughs) Quite. Because workers are going to ask, why should we help to restart an economy based fundamentally on the exploitation of our class by them, big business, the capitalist boss class. Mm -hmm. Why should we go back to the lies that there's no money for us Mm -hmm. while the shareholder profits pile up? The alternative to workers helping the capitalists to restart the economy is democratic socialist planning of the economy in the interests of the overwhelming majority of people and the environment, isn't Mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. How do we get that? Well, again, that's a bit hard to go from the day-to-day life now, but it starts with that, doesn't it? It starts with organising, with struggle in the workplace and the communities now. In the trade unions? In the trade unions, absolutely, with the democratic organisations that workers can build to defend our safety, but also our rights and our interests. And as soon as possible, when possible, which could be sooner rather than later, we can't put a time frame on it, that will need to be linked up Mm. locally between workplaces, regionally, nationally, through the existing organisations, like you said, the trade unions being built and being participated in a much broader way than is the case today through democratic building of that and through new organisations where necessary as well. And everything's going to be tested, actually, isn't it? Every Mm -hmm. organisation, as the struggles develop to maintain and build on the gains that have been made by working class people in this situation, everything will be tested to see what suits the needs of the working class in defending society's interests against big business interests and the organisations that fight for them. Leaders will be tested. Mm -hmm. Ideas will be tested. Everything will be tested. And we think socialist ideas will be proved extremely valuable in that situation. And there will also need to be a political side to it. Yes, there's the question of the trade unions. But when workers built the trade unions through their need to organise the struggle in the workplaces collectively, building a political voice for the working class became a logical step because you could win in the workplace only to have your gains lost because there was no political representative party. There was only capitalist interests being represented in politics. And that's where the foundation of the Labour Party came from, as we know. There's always been a battle for ideas within the Labour Party between socialist ideas and then leaders susceptible to pressure from big business interests as well. But key to all of this is the fight for socialist ideas. Mm for the socialist transformation of society. And that means, as we've established, a democratic socialist plan for the economy to meet the needs of all. And that's why, I think we should finish by saying, that's why we're building the Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. 
We're recruiting new members at the moment in the trade unions, people who are having to fight on all of the issues discussed here, people who can see the need for a strong socialist voice in what they're doing. We're recruiting young people who can see that their future is a question of socialism or a return to no future under capitalism, Mm. no job, university debt, no decent homes to go to, all of those things that young people face under the existing capitalist system. So it's socialism or barbarism, as the revolutionary socialist Rosa Luxemburg from Germany put it. And that is made so relevant by the situation today, when, like we touched on, the brutal conditions in India, in Africa, where... It's not just whether you get masks and stuff, it's actually whether you can have access to food and the chance to wash your hands and so on. That's what capitalism has meant with all the resources and everything being sucked out of those parts of the world by capitalism. We're also recruiting Labour Party members who joined under Corbyn but don't want to stop fighting. And we hope that people who are listening today, we haven't crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, but we're trying to set out an idea here of what the alternative is and the need to fight for it. And if you're listening to it and you agree or you want to find out more, get in touch because we want you with us in the fight for a socialist alternative to the capitalist chaos revealed by this coronavirus crisis. Thanks very much for that, Sarah. So join a union so that you can fight in your workplace because it's obvious now that the workplaces are absolutely key not just to defend your conditions, but also to go on the offensive and push the bosses back further and improve the conditions over what they were before. But then in terms of actually changing who's in power in society, political organising, join the Socialist Party. And if you're outside England and Wales, join the Committee for a Workers' International. You can apply to join the Socialist Party by visiting socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join and a member in your area will be in touch with you to discuss our ideas and what you can do to get involved, get you signed up. And if you want to fight for socialism elsewhere, it's socialistworld.net. And there's some really good statements there that we should post in the podcast notes if possible. That's right. The International Secretariat, which is, if you like, the day-to-day leadership of the Committee for a Workers' International, the World Socialist Organisation, which the Socialist Party in England and Wales is part of, is posting at the moment weekly international updates on this unprecedented catastrophe for the capitalist system. They really are required reading, and they'll be posted, as Sarah says, in the episode notes. Thanks, James. (laughs) Thank you, Sarah. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. This week we heard from Sarah Sachs Eldridge speaking to James Ivans, and I'm Helen Patterson. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We need your help to help maintain our independent political voice right when it's most important during this generation-defining global catastrophe. The pandemic is disrupting us too, hence the two-week gap between our last episode and this. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people. We're always asking for finance. But right now, because we can't raise money from our usual campaigning activity on the streets, we need it more than ever. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. If you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for, we need you. Join our campaign to build a truly effective working class socialist fighting force in the trade union and labour movement. Join the Socialist Party now. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the episode notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. And for the latest statements on working class demands, socialist analysis and reports from the front line, check the Socialist Party's website, socialistparty.org.uk and our Facebook page. If you have comments, questions or something you want to hear from us, contact us on Socialism Podcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. Till next time, solid.